Matt, you right? you you wrote um, or co-authored a paper that came out earlier this year that was a, a survey, not an experiment, but a survey that looked at over 300 users of rapamycin. So this is a you know a bunch of people who are clearly using rapamycin off label, which is a completely legal thing to do. It just means that there is no indication for its use. And you compared them to a group of people you tried your best to match. Uh, nearly 200, if I recall, who were, you know, hopefully as similar as possible in terms of their health consciousness, which would be an obvious confounder, uh, but who were not rapamycin users. Can you give us some of the the highlights of what that survey discovered? Right. So, so yeah, I mean, I think you described the study pretty well, and I think it's important to be cognizant of all of the limitations that go along with, with a study like that, um, because it was all self-reported, all survey-based. We got, in some ways, lucky in the sense that that the two populations, that what we would call the users and the non-users, appear to be pretty similar in terms of demographics and lifestyle habits, and as you said, seem to be similarly health-conscious. It's clearly a biased cohort, so if you look at that the, the responses that the individuals gave to the surveys, I don't have it sitting in front of me, but um, you know, in terms of lifestyle factors, this is a population that is not normal for what we would think of as middle America, much more health conscious than I think we would see if we did had a swath of just middle America. But for what it for what it's worth, they seem to be pretty similar. And so um, there were a few take homes from that from that study. I think the the biggest take home for me is that there really was no evidence when you looked between the people who were using rapamycin off label and the people who'd never used rapamycins for significant side effects of of any sense other than mouth sores. That was in fact the only we had one of the surveys was a list of I think thirty or forty you know potentially common side effects that have been associated with rapamycin or with other drugs. And the question was very simple. For people who'd been using rapamycin for at least three months, uh, have you experienced any of these in the past three months? And then for people who never used rapamycin, same question. The only thing that came out as statistically significantly more common in the rapamycin users was mouth sores. And that makes perfect sense. That's the most common uh, side effect that, that organ transplant patients experience. And lots and lots of people who've used. I think Peter, you've talked about. I I, I have a wicked source, one. Right? I have a wicked one at the base of my tongue <laughs> yeah. right now that I almost burnt before this podcast. Um, and so, it's my so it's my sense, only that's a nice biomarker. Positive control. I was just about to say yeah. it's my only biomarker yeah. that I know that yeah. I'm getting high quality rapamycin. <laughs> right. So in a sense, it's it's nice to see that. And it's interesting. What's the, what's the approximate the uh, frequency? Because I think in the manic study, it was surprisingly low at five milligrams I think it was weekly. Like, it was like fifteen percent. Yeah, I think it was like fifteen percent in hours as well. Okay. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it was actually. Okay. Um. So yeah. So so fifteen ish percent of people reported mouth sores. Any idea why? Any idea why this is happening? Is this believed to be immune mediated? I don't have a good explanation. David, do you? So so I have a couple of thoughts. I think first, you know, you, you're obviously not looking at the, less, the rest of your GI tract, right? So you don't really know what the potential sores are elsewhere. I mean, these are epithelia that are turning over in a couple of days. And, and we know from many studies, genetic as well as pharmacological, that rapamycin tends to impact hyperproliferative cells, right? If you look at, for example, the impact of mTOR hypomorphs in brain development, it tends to be when you make the telencephalon, the cortex, where there's massive bursts of proliferation. Lymphocytes, as we talked about, divide every eight hours. That's pretty atypical for a mammalian cell. Hmm. So I think I would argue it's sort of epithelia uh, proliferating fast and, and you're slowing it down and perhaps losing barrier function. But it's interesting. We don't see we don't see side effects at the fingernails and the hair, which are other places where you would expect to see it, at least based on chemotherapy traditionally. Yeah, although there are there are studies arguing, for example, you know, I know we've even done this. If you give high dose rapamycin before you do give some chemotherapy, you can actually, for example, prevent sort of some of the hair loss you get in mice when you when you give chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as you remove it, it's clear that you just arrested the cells and then they all sort of fall out afterwards, right? Sort of in a a, a block. But you know, mm -hmm. one thing, Peter, that I've always told many people in the pharma world for the mouth sores, which I know trouble people a lot, right? I, I've never taken rapamycin, but but I know it can be pretty bad. Why don't people do FK506 mouthwashes? I don't get this, right? Because all you need to do is occupy. Stuart Schreiber showed this, I don't know, ages ago, right? 
if you occupy the FK the rap the FKBP of FK506, rapamycin has nothing to act on in your mouth. And you'll prevent this. Because as far as I know, FK506 does not do this. And so you just need to occupy, or even with a benign a rapamycin-like molecule, all you need is an FKBP binder to sop up the binding sites that rapamycin would use. To me, it seems like a, you know, I don't know how often probably you have to depends, do it. And I know it probably it, depends, yeah, it probably depends on the frequency with which you do it and what, what FK506 tastes like. <laughs> sure, but if the mouth sores are that bad, but you could yeah. use, you could use, there are rapamycin FK6 analogs, they're completely inert, mm -hmm. right? They simply bind to FKBP, but they can't then target uh, FK, um, calcineur in the case of FK506 or mTOR in the case of rapamycin. All I'm saying is you just need to tie up your yeah. FKBP. Yeah, interesting experiment, right? Because uh, again, you know, that, and I think you're probably right, but that does make the assumption that the mouth sores are actually caused by inhibition of mTOR in those cells inside the mouth. And I don't think we formally know that at this point. So I com you know, completely yeah. agree. We don't know but that. That, that but would be the experiment the to, to, to help yeah. elucidate that. Or, or this, an, a more interesting experiment, and this is something we would love to do, is whether rapamycin toothpaste or rapamycin mouthwash or something like that specifically delivered to the oral cavity is that sufficient to get some of the benefits that we've shown in mice from systemic rapamycin treatment on periodontal disease gingival inflammation bone growth around the teeth so that's again a tangent from what we were talking about but i think super nice. interesting and unexplored um to i want to come to back the to the dogs yeah i want to talk talk to me about any of the immune stuff that you saw because you know you happened to run yeah. this survey during covid what did you learn right. there right so so first to go back to the side effects there were other side effects that were statistically different between the groups but they were all the other direction lower in the rapamycin the people had been taking rapamycin um, those included things like abdominal cramps which i don't know you know that's harder to 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 really develop many hypotheses around the ones i thought were interesting were depression and anxiety and there's a whole growing body of literature on the role of mTOR and inhibition of mTOR in various types of neurocognitive behavioral um, uh, aspects and so it makes me wonder if that actually might be real that that to some extent in some people rapamycin could actually have some what in this case appear to be beneficial effects may not always be beneficial effects on things like depression and anxiety. So I thought that piece was interesting and certainly worthy of further study. And I know there are some people working with rapamycin, sometimes in the context of ketamine for things like depression, chronic pain. So I think there's a lot of interesting biology there that, that hasn't really been explored. Yeah. Can you, can you say more about that, Matt? Because I was just about to ask you about the role. What is ketamine doing to mTOR? Because I, I thought that ketamine- I thought it was the opposite, guys. So I thought did rapamycin I. caused yeah. depression, right? I thought in, in, in trials of, in other types of trials, rapamycin depression was one of the side effects. And, and certainly the ketamine study argued that as well. But. Right, because ketamine is activating mTOR in the CNS, isn't it? That's right. So the, the data I'm familiar with and the clinical use that I'm familiar with is the context of rapamycin actually in combination with ketamine enhancing the effects of ketamine, both in terms of magnitude and how long they last. In other words, that when you combine rapamycin with ketamine, you can sometimes go to a lower dose and reduce the frequency at which patients are using ketamine. Although, again, I think a lot of this is not published. There are at least a couple of studies that have showed a potentiating combination effect of rapamycin with ketamine in, I think, patients with severe depression, but I don't remember for sure off the top of my head. I've talked to psychiatrists who are using this combination who at least give anecdotal reports of pretty potent uh, outcomes in some patients who have severe chronic pain mm. from combining rapamycin with ketamine. So again, I think it's pretty early. A lot of this is being done off label and is not being written up the way we would like it to be reported in the literature to, to really, so people can learn from each other. Um, but there's absolutely, uh, people using that combination now in clinical practice. That's interesting because I think the initial, I think it was from Dumont at Yale, where he, I think the original ketamine study argued that rapamycin blocked the effect of ketamine and, and, and that was partly the argument that mTOR was involved. 
Right. Um, but I think I, I think I recall also, Matt, where you're saying that that there's some discrepancy there, right? And it might be blood brain barrier access, it might be things like this that are quite different and very dose dependent. Yeah. It sounds like we need to go back to that original study and make sure we all we all <laughs> we're all on the same page. But that's it. So all I can tell you is I, I know from conversations with people who are actually using this now that there are people using the combination of rapamycin with ketamine and at least anecdotally sometimes uh, reporting pretty significant changes in in outcomes. And and the ketamine is intranasal, intravenous, intramuscular. Does it matter? I don't know. Yeah, okay. outside my my area of expertise. Um, let's so go back to the I survey. Would... Yeah, let's go back to the survey. Yeah. The other things, because I, I think if I the other thing that I remember jumping out at me was, and again, lots of confounders here. If you have a healthier population who's more health conscious, right. and that's why they're taking rapa because they're they're literally at the periphery of what one would do. That could easily explain the observation that they got COVID less, and when they got it, they were less impacted by it. Yeah. So let me tell you what we what we observed in the data, right? And again, with all the caveats that that there are around the way the study was was designed and and carried out. So within there again, two populations: people who had ever used rapamycin, they're all in the rapamycin user group. People who had never used rapamycin, they're in the non-user group. But when you look within the rapamycin user group, we actually had three categories of people in the context of COVID nineteen infection. Some people didn't start taking rapamycin until after they had had their COVID-19 infection. Some people took it before, but not after or not during. And then there were people who took it continuously throughout. throughout. And so we tried to group them that way and look at if there were any differences between the groups. So first of all, no difference in frequency of infection that was significant. So didn't, there's no reason to believe based on our data that rapamycin impacted the likelihood that yes. somebody would get a positive COVID-19 result. And, you know, again, this is self-reported. So we asked people if they, to confirm that this was a, a positive result from a test, but we're going by what they told us, right? So we can't, we don't have any laboratory confirmation. So the interesting thing was that the people who took rapamycin after they got their COVID-19 infection looked just like the people who never took rapamycin. That makes sense, they shouldn't. And we were looking at two things. Severity of infection, again, self-reported as mild, moderate, or severe, and we had specific criteria for length of symptoms and hospitalization for each of those groups. And then self-reported long COVID, as in experiencing ongoing symptoms of, of COVID after like a three-month period. Um, so no difference between people who started taking rapamycin after their infection and non-users. No difference between people who took rapamycin before their infection but stopped taking it. Big difference, at least statistically significant, between people who took rapamycin throughout and all of the other groups, where people who took rapamycin throughout had lower severity of infection. And the numbers were really small, so we, I don't want to make too much of it, but signif statistically significantly less likelihood of reporting symptoms associated with long COVID. So it's at least, I think, suggestive of the idea that rapamycin continuous use throughout the period of infection and resolution of symptoms, it may be associated with a lower likelihood of severity of outcome and lower likelihood of long COVID. And again, I think that might make sense in the context of at least how, how at, a, at a crude level, we kind of think COVID, long COVID in particular is working and severe COVID infections, which is there's this hyper-inflammatory or chronic inflammatory response. It kind of makes sense that rapamycin use may have benefits in the context of that prolonged in inflammation or hyper-inflammatory response. So that might explain um, what we saw in the data. But again, I think it's just suggestive and, and worthy of potentially future work to really disentangle. And I will say, I don't think there's any reason to think this is specific to COVID-19. This is this may be a general property of rapamycin for a bunch of different types of at least viral infections. Mm -hmm.